Hello and welcome to part three of the Biology 6 Cardiovascular System Lecture. Okay, we are now done with talking about cardiac output, stroke volume, and heart rate. At least for now we're done. Uh, we are now going to be going to begin discussing another entirely different aspect of the cardiovascular system, uh, one called blood pressure. To uh, picture what blood pressure is, let's uh, first look at this uh, this uh, animation of the cardiovascular system. And let's just pick one of these arteries, maybe this artery right here. So imagine we're going to zoom in on this artery right here. Here it is. Okay, so the blood is flowing through that particular artery, artery in a particular direction. In this uh, example, the blood is flowing from, uh, from left to right through this artery, right? Well, even though the blood is flowing in that direction, you know, from, from left to right through this artery, even though that's the direction it's flowing, simultaneously, the blood is pushing outward on the walls of the, uh, of the artery. And that outward pressure uh, of the blood, um, the outward force of the blood on the blood vessel walls is what blood pressure is. That's the definition of uh, blood pressure, the blood's outward force on the blood vessel walls. Now, um, when people take uh, blood pressure, or I should say blood pressure is defined as the pressure, the outward pressure in the arteries, not the capillaries and not the veins. The, just by definition, it's the outward pressure in the walls of the arteries. Um, now, you might wonder, well, why is that? Well, give me a minute and I will explain. Okay, so um, yeah, blood pressure is the outward force of the blood on the vessel walls and it's always taken in the arteries. Um, now, all measurements have some sort of unit, like if you're measuring how long something is, at least in the metric system, you would use meters as your unit of length. And, you know, for another example, cardiac output, it's units were milliliters per minute, remember? Well, blood pressure has its own units. Uh, the, the units of blood pressure are called millimeters of mercury, which is written MMHG. And it sounds a bit weird, you know, millimeters of mercury, uh, but uh, it is, that is the unit of, of, of blood pressure, millimeters of mercury. Okay, well, um, so let's imagine now that a, a person's blood pressure is measured. Well, when we measure a person's blood pressure, we always get two pressure numbers, not one. And here's the reason why. The uh, blood pressure is higher when the ventricles are contracting than when the ventricles are relaxing. And that kind of makes sense because any liquid is going to have a higher pressure when you squeeze on it, right? And so when the ventricles are contracting, when they're squeezing on the blood, that's going to make the blood have a higher pressure. And when the ventricles are relaxing, when the ventricles are not squeezing on the blood, um, that's going to make the blood have a lower pressure. So they call the higher pressure the systolic blood pressure, the blood pressure during ventricular systole. And they call the lower blood pressure the diastolic pressure. That's the, um, the blood pressure during ventricular diastole. Okay, and as you can see here, I'm putting some numbers there. Um, 120 over 80. I'm showing those blood pressure numbers because those are the average blood pressure numbers of an average adult at rest. At rest. Um, 120 is the average systolic pressure of an adult and 80 is the average diastolic pressure of an adult. And as usual, not everybody is exactly that. You know, one person might be 127 uh, over 63. Oh, yeah, yeah, you say over when you're describing the uh, two blood pressure numbers. You always give the systolic number first, followed by the diastolic number, and you put over between them. So an average person's blood pressure is 120 over 80. Uh, but yeah, like I was saying, it, it varies from person to person. One person's might be 128 over 84. Another person's blood pressure might be 115 over, over 69, something like that. But for on average for adults the resting blood pressure is 120 over 80. Okay so you remember that with every cardiac cycle your ventricles contract and then relax so with each and every cardiac cycle your blood pressure goes up down up down up down yeah each and every cardiac cycle makes your blood pressure go to the systolic value then the diastolic value 
systolic pressure, diastolic pressure, systolic pressure, diastolic pressure, systolic pressure, diastolic pressure with each and every cardiac cycle. You know, so if the person is, is, um, has the average blood pressure numbers with every cardiac cycle, their blood pressure goes 120, 80, and then 120, 80 in the next cardiac cycle, 120, 80, 120, 80 with each and every cardiac cycle. Okay, uh, one more thing about the blood pressure. Uh, the blood pressure always decreases throughout the systemic loop. And what does that mean? Well, it means that their blood pressure is going to be highest in the arteries that are closest to the heart because those are the beginning of the systemic loop, right? But the further the blood flows through the systemic loop, the lower the blood pressure is going to become. So like if you measure their blood pressure in some arteries that are a little bit further out, from the heart, let's say right here, the blood pressure is going to be a little bit less. And how much less? Well, I don't know exactly, but if I had to take a guess, like maybe uh, if you measured it there, you would only find maybe 90 over 40, you know, just, just to pick some numbers randomly. But the point is it's going to be less than the blood pressure in the arteries that are closer to their heart. And then if you measured their blood pressure even further along the systemic loop, let's say uh, uh, maybe right here in these veins right here, it's going to be even less blood pressure. And again, you know, I, I don't know exactly what it would be, but just to pick up, pick some number, maybe at that point it might only be 40 over 10. Um, and then if you go even further along the systemic loop, where the systemic loop is coming to an end in these vena cava right here, it would be essentially zero. So yeah, if you tried to measure the blood pressure in the final veins of the systemic loop, you would find it almost to be zero. Uh, and there's some consequences of this. Uh, one consequence is that if a person cuts a, a major blood vessel and that major blood vessel is an artery, the blood's going to come spurting out, uh, right? Because, you know, the, the, the pressure is high there and when liquids are high, they'll come spurting out if you, if you uh, make a hole in the vessel. So, yeah, if a person cuts a major artery, especially when closest to the heart, the blood goes squirt, squirt, squirt. Uh, high pressure out, out of a cut in the vessel. But if a person were to cuss, cut a vein, especially one close to the heart, there's so little pressure there, the blood wouldn't spurt at all. The blood would still come out, but it would sort of ooze out, not a pressurized spurting. Yeah, so you can kind of tell whether a person has cut an artery or a vein by if the blood is spurting out or just kind of oozing out without spurting. Um, and... Uh, because the uh, the blood pressure is lowest in the veins, that's why we measure blood pressure in arteries. If you tried to measure the blood pressure in veins, it would appear to be almost zero, and that's not really a useful measurement. We're more interested in the blood pressure uh, in the arteries, the ones closest to the heart, so that's why it's taken there. Oh, one more thing. Why do doctors and nurses take our blood pressure? Well, uh, the person's blood pressure can be used to judge the health of their cardiovascular system. And uh, in particular, if the person has high blood pressure, you know, a lot higher than the average 120 over 80, uh, that's a sign of a, that the person has a disease called atherosclerosis. Uh, and we'll talk more about atherosclerosis later on in this lecture, but that's the major reason for taking the blood pressure. It, it indicates the health of the person's cardiovascular system, and a particular high blood pressure is a sign of atherosclerosis. Um, okay, so remember that an average person's blood pressure is 120 over 80, but don't get freaked out if your own blood pressure is not exactly that. There's, there's quite a bit of variation. Okay, um, so let me just, as an example, say that your blood pressure is 120 over 80. The person sitting next to you might have a higher or lower blood pressure than you do. So maybe the person sitting next to you, their blood pressure might be 128 over 74 and the person next to them, their blood pressure might be 133 over 94, and the person sitting next to them, I don't know, it might be um, 110 over 72. Um, so, you know, why is it that one person's blood pressure is different from another person's blood pressure? Well, that's what we're going to talk about here. What are the factors that set a person's blood pressure? And it's not even just a difference between one person's blood pressure and another person's blood pressure. Even within the same person, the blood pressure can vary at different times in their life. Like when you're in your 20s, you might have relatively low blood pressure, something like, I don't know, 109 over 63. 
And then as you get into your later years, like you know, mid 40s or mid 50s, maybe your blood pressure at that point has gone up to 130 over 87. And then when you get your senior years, maybe your blood pressure is even higher. Maybe your blood pressure is at 145 over, over 95 or something like that. And so again, what we're addressing is, is what, what sets a person's blood pressure, what would make a person's blood pressure be higher or, or lower. Well, there are two main factors that set a person's blood pressure. And those two factors are called the cardiac output and the peripheral resistance. Um, let me see what my slide here is. Here we go. I mentioned the cardiac output a few minutes ago. Remember that the cardiac output is the volume of blood that the heart pumps per minute. And so I'm not really going to discuss that, the cardiac output effect on blood pressure very much because I think it's, it's kind of intuitively it makes sense that you know the cardiac output is how much blood the heart is pumping into the blood vessels every minute. And so I think you, could, you can see that if a person has a really high cardiac output, their heart is stuffing more blood every minute into the blood vessels. You know, it's pumping a lot of blood into the blood vessels. And so that would naturally tend, tend to pressurize the blood because the heart's pumping it into the blood vessels faster. So yeah, a higher cardiac output just naturally leads to a higher blood pressure. And conversely, if the person for whatever reason had a low cardiac output, you know, their, their heart is not pumping very much blood into their blood vessels every minute, then that would tend to lower the pressure of the blood in their vessels, so they would have a lower uh, blood pressure. Anyway, so cardiac output is, is one factor that sets the person's blood pressure. The other factor is something called peripheral resistance. And I haven't defined what it is yet, but before I do, I'll just say that the higher the peripheral resistance, the higher the person's blood pressure is going to be, and the lower the peripheral resistance, the lower the person's blood pressure is going to be. And in fact, it's the peripheral resistance which is actually the major thing that sets the person's blood pressure. So like, you know, if one person has a higher blood pressure than you do, that other person probably has a higher peripheral resistance than you do. And if another person has a lower blood pressure than you do, they probably have a lower peripheral resistance. Or just talking about you in particular, if when you're in your 20s you have a low blood pressure and then when you're in your 50s you have a higher blood pressure, it's, it's most likely a change in the peripheral resistance that gave you the higher blood pressure. Okay, so what is this peripheral resistance that affects our blood pressure? Well, here it is. It's defined as the blood vessel's resistance to blood flow. Um, I remember somebody, somebody said, it's, think of it as the friction of the blood going through the, through the blood vessels as the peripheral resistance. Now, let me give you an example of that. Let's remember that the, the, the arteries, the blood vessels in general, but the arteries in particular, have that thick tunica media that the body can, can squeeze down on to, uh, to make the, the artery lumen smaller. So here's the heart pumping some blood into an artery. Let's imagine that for whatever reason, the body decides to squeeze this artery to a smaller size. You know, so the, the body sends signals to the tunica media on that artery to squeeze it to a smaller size. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so there's the artery with its big muscular tunica media. Yeah, so for whatever reason, the body decides to squeeze that to a smaller size like that. Well, the smaller the lumen of the blood vessel, the harder it is for the heart to pump the blood through. That's just kind of a, a law of physics that it's, it's, you have to use more force to stuff a liquid through a smaller vessel. And so the heart has to squeeze extra hard now, right? To get that blood to flow through. And remember that our idea, that the, 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 the concept that the harder you squeeze on a liquid, the more pressurized it gets. And so there's higher peripheral resistance in this artery now because its lumen is smaller. And because there's more resistance, the, the heart has to squeeze harder to get the blood to flow through that artery. And anytime the heart squeezes harder on the blood, that increases the blood pressure. So that's, that in a nutshell is, is, is kind of how peripheral resistance works. If, if something makes the lumen smaller, there's more peripheral resistance. The more peripheral resistance, the heart has to contract harder to make the blood flow through that blood vessel. 
and the harder the contraction, you get a higher blood pressure. All right, and I, I don't have this on, in the cartoon, but I think you can imagine it. If, the, if that blood vessel relaxed, if that artery relaxed so that the lumen got larger, then you know, it, there's less resistance the larger the lumen is. So you'd have a, a larger lumen means a smaller peripheral resistance. Therefore, the heart does not have to squeeze very hard and therefore the, the blood pressure goes, uh, goes down. Okay, so yeah, peripheral resistance is the main thing that sets a person's blood pressure, and it's the resistance to, uh, of the blood flowing through the blood vessels, and the major thing that sets it is the size of the lumen. Smaller lumen equals more peripheral resistance, so higher blood pressure, and larger lumen equals less peripheral resistance, so lower blood pressure. In my example here, I was using the body making the artery smaller by contracting the tunica media. Let me go back. Go back. Oop, wait one second. Here we go. Uh, in my example of what made the, the lumen smaller, I said that the body had contracted the tunica media of this artery, you know, to to make the artery smaller. Well, that's part of the normal and healthy functioning of the body. You know, um, like I gave an example, um, when you're exercising, your body reduces the blood flow to your digestive organs by contracting the tunica media of those arteries going to your uh, digestive organs. And yeah, that's part of the normal, healthy, proper functioning of the body. There's another thing that can make your lumen smaller and therefore increase your blood pressure that's not a proper healthy thing, uh, and it, it's something called atherosclerosis. Uh, and it's basically where the lumen of your arteries gets clogged up with what are called plaques. Plaques are deposits of cholesterol and fat. And so here you see an artery of a person who has atherosclerosis. This is supposed to be this hollow, wide open lumen right here, but you can see this white looking stuff in there. That's a, that's a plaque, that's a big ball of fat and cholesterol. And you can see that it's, it's really blocking a lot of the lumen. And so the person's blood pressure is gonna go up, right? Because the lumen is smaller, and so there's more peripheral resistance in getting the blood to flow through that artery, and then the, blood has, the, the heart has to squeeze extra hard to get the blood to flow and that's gonna be uh, increased blood pressure. So here's the cartoon of it. Uh, it's more peripheral resistance in this artery, not because the body is contracting the tunica media, but because the person has atherosclerosis and they've got these plaques there, so you get a smaller lumen, and well, it raises their blood pressure because there's more peripheral resistance. Um, We'll talk more about atherosclerosis uh, uh, towards the end of this lecture, but just right now I want to use it as an example of something that can make the lumen smaller and therefore give you more peripheral resistance, therefore higher blood pressure. Okay, uh, well, um, so it's changes in the lumen size are the main thing that causes uh, changes in the peripheral resistance and therefore causes changes in the blood pressure. There's another thing that can also change the peripheral resistance, but it has nothing to do with the size of the lumen. This other thing that can change the peripheral resistance is the total volume of blood. Um, I didn't write it here, but I, I do want you to know the average blood volume. For an average adult, their blood volume is around five liters of blood. And I wish I brought in some two liter Coke bottles, because uh, um, you know, in terms of liters, I think people are most familiar with the liters in terms, terms of those two liter soft drink bottles. And so if I had, let's see, uh, two of those two liter Coke bottles, and then a third one that was half full, that would be five liters total. And so that's an average adult's blood volume is, is five liters. Um, if a person has a larger blood volume than average, that causes an increase in peripheral resistance, so a higher blood pressure, 
And if a person has a lower blood, blood volume than the average, you know, less than five liters, then that causes smaller resistance to the blood flow and therefore the person tends to have lower blood pressure. And I, I was trying to think of a good analogy for why a larger blood volume causes more resistance. And what I thought of is shopping carts. Imagine one person has a shopping cart that's just full of all this big, heavy stuff. It's hard to push that shopping cart, right? You have to strain harder to, to push it. And another person has a shopping cart that has very little groceries, just a, you know, a couple of bags of potato chips. It's easy to push that. And so just it's natural. We see that it's just naturally harder to push larger, heavier things than it is to push smaller, lighter things. And so just naturally, the larger the blood volume, it's harder for the heart to push, so you get more peripheral resistance. And I think I tried to show that on the cartoon here. Let's say this person right here has the normal blood volume of five liters, and so the heart, it's fairly easy for the heart to pump that because that's the normal blood volume. But let's say for whatever reason, the person had a larger blood volume, maybe six or seven liters. Well, now the heart has to work extra hard to push that larger volume of blood and so we get the same concept. Whatever makes the heart squeeze harder on the blood increases the blood pressure. And so, just so you'll get a higher uh, blood pressure the larger the blood volume. Oh, let me relate this to something uh, medicinal. Um, so if a person has too high a blood pressure, the doctors can give that person medicine to, to lower their blood pressure back to a health, healthier level. And there are different types of blood pressure lowering medicines. One type um, are called diuretics, and they make the person urinate a lot. And you might say, well, why would urinating a lot lower their blood pressure? Well, the, the kidneys make the urine from the blood. And so if a person is urinating a lot, it's because their kidneys are removing extra water from the blood. And that lowers the total blood volume. Yeah, so a person who's on these diuretics to lower their blood pressure, they, they pee a lot, that lowers their blood volume, and so they get less peripheral resistance, and so that lowers their blood pressure. All right, and uh, matter of fact, there you see the kidneys. Uh, yeah, so they, they make the urine, but they make the urine from substances that they re remove from the blood. All righty, yeah, so just to summarize, the two factors that affect your blood pressure are the cardiac output, how many, the volume of blood that your heart pumps per minute, and the peripheral resistance, but this is the major one, the peripheral resistance, you know, the blood vessels resistance to blood flow, that's the major one that sets your blood pressure. And so if a person's blood pressure goes up, you know, from when they're in their 20s to when they're in their 50s, it's almost certain that it's a change in peripheral resistance. Your, your cardiac output doesn't change all that much uh, during your lifespan. Okay, um, well, the, the body has ways of regulating the blood pressure. Um, and in particular, the body seems to be concerned with raising the blood pressure if it gets too low. Now, why does the body want to ma raise your blood pressure back up if, it gets, if your blood pressure gets too low? Well, there are various processes inside the body that rely on a certain level of blood pressure. So if something causes your blood pressure to suddenly drop way below normal, those processes aren't going to function right, and that can threaten your health. Um, what sort of processes in the body depend on your blood pressure? Well. Your kidneys are a good example. Um, so I, I just mentioned that the kidneys make the urine, and that's true. But the kidneys also clean your blood. And to clean your blood properly, the kidneys need a certain amount of blood pressure. Um, so if your blood pressure suddenly goes a lot lower than normal, your kidneys are not going to be cleaning the blood properly. And that is a definite threat to your health. And so what I'm saying is, yeah, if your body detects a drop in blood pressure, your body wants to boost that blood pressure back up um, for one reason, to, to make sure your kidneys uh, are functioning correctly to, to clean your blood. And so given that, 
since the functioning of the kidneys, you know, cleaning the blood depends on you having a high enough level of blood pressure, it's maybe not too, too surprising if I tell you that the kidneys are major regulators of your blood pressure. So, you know, since the kidneys doing their job depends on keeping you at a certain level of blood pressure, it kind of makes sense that the kidneys take on the responsibility of making sure that your blood pressure stays high enough. And so that's what I want to discuss here. How do your kidneys raise up your blood pressure if your kidneys detect that your blood pressure has gone way below normal? Well, one thing that your kidneys can do to boost up your blood pressure if, if your blood pressure gets too low is to add sodium to the blood. Um, here is your blood in this blood vessel right here. And yeah, if your kidneys detect that your blood pressure is getting too low, your kidneys will start putting some sodium ions into your blood, basically make your blood salty. And you know, how is that going to increase your blood pressure? Well, it increases your blood pressure because that causes water to flow into your blood vessels from, this, from the tissue fluid. Now, who remembers, why would a high concentration of those sodium ions attract water? What process is that? Osmosis, very good, yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe I put it here. Yeah. So a anytime you have a high concentration of solutes, that's going to attract water by osmosis. So the kidneys are basically using osmosis to increase your blood volume if your blood pressure gets too low. So again, the kidneys, if the kidneys sense your blood pressure is too low, the kidneys add sodium to the blood. That pulls in water to the blood by osmosis. And so your blood volume gets larger, right? Because you now have, have that extra water going into your blood. And as we just talked about, I'm going back a page now. If we just talked about the larger your blood volume, the more peripheral resistance, so the higher your, your blood pressure. Good. Yeah, so if your kidney sent your blood pressure is too low, they add salt to the blood, and that increases your blood pressure. Um, your kidneys have another trick that they can do to raise your blood pressure if your blood pressure gets too low. And it involves a protein called angiotensin 2, which sounds like a movie sequel. You know, if you liked angiotensin 1, you will love angiotensin 2. But it's, it's not a movie, it's a blood protein. Um, and this angiotensin 2 blood protein can raise your blood pressure. But here's the thing. This angiotensin II protein is usually present in your blood in an inactive form. So un under normal circumstances, it's not raising your blood pressure. But your kidneys can activate it, can activate the angiotensin II. So yeah, if your kidneys detect that your blood pressure is suddenly dropping, your kidneys activate this angiotensin II protein. When the angiotensin II protein is activated, it causes all your arteries to, sque uh, to squeeze to a smaller size. And I think we'll see that here when I click the button. Watch the arteries here. They all contracted. Um, and so remember, that's going to increase your blood pressure because the smaller the lumen size, the harder the heart has to squeeze to make the blood flow. And the harder the heart squeezes, the higher the blood pressure. Good. So the kidneys, if they sense your blood pressure is low, they add salt to raise your blood pressure by increasing the blood volume. And the kidneys also respond by activating angiotensin II, which causes vasoconstr vasoconstriction is the official term for when blood vessels squeeze to a smaller size. And that also raises your blood pressure. Here's kind of a, a medicine-related thing. Um, if a person has high blood pressure, um, well, I guess I mentioned that the doctors can give the person diuretics to make them urinate more to lower their blood pressure. Another medicine that the doctors can give if a person has high blood pressure is an enzyme that blocks angiotensin II from being activated. And that should make sense, because remember, angiotensin II, when it gets activated, and uh, raises the blood pressure. So by blocking that enzyme medicinally, uh, it tends to lower the person's blood pressure. Um, you don't have to know this term, but th those medicines are called ACE inhibitors uh, that block angiotensin II from being activated. 
Okay, well, so like I say, the, the kidneys are major regulators of your blood pressure, especially involved in making your blood pressure higher if your blood pressure drops too low. Uh, some other factors that can also affect your blood pressure. Let's see. Uh, the sympathetic division of the nervous system. So let's remember that. The sympathetic division of the nervous system is the part of the nervous system that gets more active when you're angry or frightened. And the neurons of the sympathetic division synapse with your tunica media of your arteries. And they, they, they generally cause the tunica media to contract. And so yeah, if you're angry or frightened, sympathetic division causes the lumen size to get smaller by, you know, by squeezing uh, in the tunica media of the arteries. And that causes more peripheral resistance. Uh, and so it tends to ra raise the blood pressure. Um, your sympathetic division also uh, gets more active if there's a sudden drop in your blood pressure. And so you get the same thing. If your blood pressure drops some, suddenly, sympathetic division neurons cause the tunica media to contract. That increases the peripheral resistance and ra raises your blood pressure back up. You can also get high blood pressure if you eat a lot of salts in your diet. Um, this is pretty much the same of what we just saw with the kidneys. Uh, yeah, so if you love salty things, salted popcorn, salted potato chips or whatever, when you eat those salty things, you're putting sodium ions in your blood. And then by osmosis, that attracts water into your blood from the tissue fluid. And then that increases your, the volume of your blood. You know, you, you get more than the f normal five liters of blood. And that increases your peripheral resistance with the larger blood volume. So you get a higher blood pressure. And uh, I guess I mentioned this also, atherosclerosis, which is this disease where you get these plaques, these, these deposits of fat and cholesterol inside your blood vessels. Uh, that makes the lumen smaller, so more peripheral resistance, so higher blood pressure. Um, oh yeah, so how do you get that? Uh, if you eat a diet that's high in fat and cholesterol, that tends to uh, cause those plaques to form in your arteries. Which actually brings us to near the last part of this lecture. Um, what we're going to do for this last part of this lecture on the cardiovascular system is talk about disorders, dis diseases of the cardiovascular system. And uh, we're going to talk about, well, I just mentioned it, atherosclerosis, something called chronic hypertension, something called congestive heart failure, and um, a heart attack, myocardial infarction, and something called shock. Oh yeah, so, so, so these are all problems of the cardiovascular system. And I guess we're here already for, with atherosclerosis. Um, so uh, it's sometimes called heart disease, although the proper medical term is atherosclerosis. And so I said, well, I pretty much already said it there, arteries that have become partially clogged with plaque. And these plaque are, are deposits of fat and cholesterol that build up in, inside, the, uh, inside the arteries. And you can find, a person who has atherosclerosis, you can find these plaques throughout their cardiovascular system. But for some reason, you tend to get more of them in the aorta and the coronary arteries. Remember, the coronary arteries are the arteries that feed the heart uh, muscle itself with blood. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about atherosclerosis and chronic hypertension and congestive heart failure and myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. And th there's actually some relationships, cause and effect relationships between all of those. And so I'm going to make kind of a chart here that you should uh, copy down. OK, so atherosclerosis, yeah, that's where your arteries become clogged with these fatty deposits. Um, and yeah, how you get them is if you eat a diet that's, that's high in, in cholesterol and fats. Um, OK, now, so remember that if a person has atherosclerosis, the size of their lumens and their arteries get smaller. And so that increases the peripheral resistance. And so that means the heart has to squeeze harder. And that makes the blood pressure higher. So atherosclerosis leads to high blood pressure. And if, if a person has atherosclerosis, 
their blood pressure is going to constantly be high because their, their arteries are constantly clogged with these, uh, with these plaques. And there's a term for constant high blood pressure. It's called chronic hypertension. Hypertension means high blood pressure, and chronic means the person has it constantly. Um, and maybe I should mention that you know, all of us occasionally have high blood pressure. Like, for example, if you decide you want to indulge and have a very salty meal, you know, at, at, for a few hours, you're going to have high blood pressure from the salt you ate. But then your kidneys will get, eventually get rid of those extra salts, and then your blood pressure will go back to normal. Or if somebody cuts you off in traffic and it makes you angry, you know, that activates your sympathetic division, and which temporarily constricts your blood vessels. So uh, again, you have high blood pressure. But that's not constant high blood pressure. That's just for a brief time. But atherosclerosis, those plaques are, are fairly permanent. And so the person's going to get constant high blood pressure. And that's chronic hypertension. So uh, notice what this means. If a person has atherosclerosis, they're going to have high blood pressure, constant high blood pressure. That's why doctors are concerned if they measure your blood pressure and they find that it's high because, uh, you know, because it's a sign of atherosclerosis. And so if you or somebody in your family has high blood pressure, has chronic hypertension, you need to take it seriously because that's what's going on inside your blood vessels is, is the means that you have atherosclerosis. Okay, so chronic hypertension, it's defined as a constant blood pressure that's constantly ab above 140 over 90, you know, systolic over diastolic, and almost always it's a sign of atherosclerosis. As a matter of fact, if the doctors find high blood pressure, they just automatically assume it's atherosclerosis. And chronic hypertension does not cause any physical pain. You know, it doesn't hurt to have high blood pressure, but nevertheless, it is hurting your heart. Um, the heart has to squeeze extra hard to pump the blood past all those plaques, and so it eventually wears out the heart, and that leads to what we call congestive heart failure. The heart gets too weak to adequately circulate the blood. That's congestive heart failure. And just to be clear, congestive heart failure is not the same as a heart attack. Uh, congestive heart failure is, is very different from a heart attack. A heart attack is a is sudden damage to the heart. You know, the person's walking along fine, then all of a sudden, oh, and you know, they, they could just suddenly fall down and perhaps die from the heart attack. Congestive heart failure is, is different. It, it, it's something that takes slowly comes on over over years or even decades. It's not something that just acute suddenly kills kills the person, uh, you know, within a matter of minutes. And so I'll, I'll write here uh, after many years. Yeah, so if a person has chronic hypertension, the heart has to pump extra hard to make the blood flow, you know, uh, past all those plaques. And the heart just wears itself out after, after decades and decades of, of that high pressure pumping. And so after decades and decades, the person gets congestive heart failure. The heart just gets too weak to adequately circulate the blood. And so, um, oh yeah, so here you see the person with atherosclerosis, and so the heart has to squeeze extra hard, and so the person's going to have chronic hypertension, and then after years of this, the heart gets worn out, and they get congestive heart failure. Um, so what, what are the symptoms of it? Well, fatigue is one. Fatigue just means tiredness. Um, and it sort of makes sense, because remember, the, 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 one of the reasons you have the blood circulating is to deliver oxygen and glucose to your cells so that your cells can make energy by cellular aerobic respiration. And so if the person has inadequate circulation, the cells are not getting their normal amounts of oxygen and glucose. They're getting less. And so the cells have an energy crisis. And so the person feels, feels tired. Um, another thing that can happen with congestive heart failure, because the, the blood is circulating too slowly, is water leaks out of the blood. The, the, the slower the blood circulates, the more chance water molecules have of leaking out of, the, leaking out of the capillaries. And so you start to get water leaking out of the capillaries. 
And look up there in the lungs. One of the places where the water can leak out is in the capillaries of the lungs. And so people with congestive heart failure start to get fluid water building up inside their lungs. And it makes, them, it, makes it hard to breathe and they cough a lot. Uh, years ago, I used to rent a room in, in this house. And one of the other uh, housemates, his name was Jack. He was kind of an elderly, elderly fellow. And he had congestive heart failure. And he was just coughing all the time. And especially when he, when he laid down at night, his, his room was next to mine. And when he was going to sleep, I was just constant. <laughs> and, and that's why, because it was the, the, the fluid that was building up in his lungs because of his heart failure. And it, it actually eventually uh, uh, took his life. His, his circulation got so bad, he, he just couldn't sustain himself. Um, and it's not just in the capillaries of the, of the lungs where water leaks out if a person has congestive heart failure. Uh, all throughout their uh, arteries and veins, you get water leaking out. Um, the water especially tends to pool up down here in their, in their legs, in their lower limbs, just because those are a little bit lower down in the body. And so, oh, there we go. People with congestive heart failure tend to get swelling in their legs. The, the official term for swelling is edema. Uh, yeah, so that, that's also a sign of uh, congestive heart failure. Okay, so atherosclerosis, again, is the, the clogging of the arteries with these fatty plaques. It leads to chronic hypertension, which doesn't cause any physical pain, but nevertheless, it's slowly damaging the heart. So after years and years, the person can get congestive heart failure. So atherosclerosis can slowly kill you by going down this pathway, so to speak. But there's something else atherosclerosis can cause that can kill you within a few minutes, and that is a heart attack. The official name for that is a myocardial infarction. And so, yeah, that's not slow. That can cause a, a sudden uh, death in the person. OK, uh, so let's talk about that. What exactly is a myocardial infarction, and, and how is it related to uh, the plaques from the person's atherosclerosis? Let's see. Here we go. Well, here we see the person having the heart attack uh, here. OK. so. Here's the heart, and we're seeing the exterior of the heart here, the exterior. And remember those blood vessels on the surface are called the coronary arteries. These blood vessels here and here and here are coronary arteries. And yeah, those coronary arteries have the very important job of supplying the heart muscle itself with blood flow. Well, unfortunately, remember that when a person has atherosclerosis, the coronary arteries tend to get clogged with, uh, with plaques. Now, if you look real closely right here, I, you see I've drawn in a little plaque right there. Well, this part of the heart right here depends on that coronary artery for blood flow. Usually, uh, these plaques do not fully block a coronary artery. So this part of the heart is still getting some blood flow, even though that plaque is there. But here's the problem. Sometimes a person can get what's called a thrombus. And a thrombus is a blood clot inside an unbroken blood vessel. You know, normally our blood, we get a blood clot, the blood uh, coagulates only if we've cut ourselves. But sometimes we can get the thing called a thrombus where you get a blood clot even though you haven't cut yourself. And the problem is a thrombus can move through your arteries and other blood vessels, and then it can wedge itself where this plaque is. And so then all of a sudden, that fully blocks the blood, the coronary artery. And that's what, that's what causes most heart attacks. As a matter of fact, I think I have a cartoon of it. Uh, so there are the coronary arteries. Oh, yeah, so here's this coronary artery that's mostly blocked with these plaques. But like I say, some blood is flowing through, so the heart is still able to be healthy enough. But here comes a thrombus and it wedges itself there where that plaque is. And so now, all of a sudden, that coronary artery is fully blocked. Just within a matter of minutes, it becomes fully blocked by that thrombus and the plaque together. And so now this area of the heart right here is getting zero blood flow. And so that area of the heart muscle tissue is going to be killed off. And so that's what a myocardial infarction is, damage to the heart muscle due to a sudden blockage of one of the coronary arteries. 
and it's usually caused by a thrombus and a plaque together fully blocking the coronary artery. Oh, I guess I mentioned there that a heart attack is sometimes unofficially called a, or sorry, a myocardial infarction is sometimes unofficially called a heart attack or a coronary. Okay, uh, so what does the person feel who's having the myocardial infarction? The major symptom is chest pain, which sort of makes sense because they, you know, their heart muscles being damaged. Um, they oftentimes also feel pain in their left shoulder and their left arm. Um, that actually tends to be a, a male symptom. Females sometimes will report heart attack pain also in their neck and sometimes in their jaw. Um, the person tends to also uh, get sweating and, and feel nausea. Na nausea means that they, they, they feel like they want to throw up. So if you or somebody else uh, has those symptoms, then you know, obviously get, get medical attention right away because those are the symptoms of a, of a myocardial infarction. Oh yeah, so what do the doctors do? Oh, well, so if, if somebody around you is having a myocardial infarction, um, you need to get them to the hospital right away. I think I mentioned this in an earlier um, lecture. Let me go back one slide here. In addition to the heart muscle getting damaged, the conducting tissues of the heart can also get damaged. Remember, the conducting tissues are the, tissues are the ones that generate the electrical signals to make the heart contract rhythmically. If the conducting tissues get damaged, they can start shooting off the wrong electrical signals, and so the ventricles can start trembling instead of pumping. And what do we call that? Anybody recall? What is it? The ventricular fibrillations, right. And so if the heart attack leads to ventricular fibrillations, the person can die just within a couple of minutes because they're, they're, with, in ventricular fibrillations, there's, there's no blood being circulated. Um, and so, yeah, a heart attack just means damage to the heart muscle, but oftentimes it also leads to damage of the conducting tissues, and if that happens, the person goes into ventricular fibrillations. So a heart attack is not the same as ventricular fibrillations, but a heart attack oftentimes leads to ventricular fibrillations, and that can kill the person just in a few minutes. Okay, so what do the doctors do if a person's having a myocardial infarction? Well, they take them to the hospital. Uh, one thing they can do is inject the person with clot-dissolving drug, drugs, because remember that the heart attack is oftentimes triggered by a thrombus, a blood clot in the blood vessels, and so they have drugs that can dissolve blood clots. TPA is an example of one of these drugs, but you don't have to know the specific name, but, but um, um, they inject the person with clot-dissolving drugs, uh, drugs, and so if that dissolves the clot, that will restore the, the blood flow. Now, um, the another thing that doctors can do is something called angio, uh, oh, sorry, bypass surgery. In bypass surgery, they borrow blood vessels from other parts of the body and basically go around the clogged coronary artery. They surgically go inside and uh, the, here's the blocked blood vessel, coronary artery right here. Yeah, they borrow arteries from other parts of the body and just go around the blocked blood vessel. Um, another thing the doctors can do, other than bypass surgery, is uh, something called angioplasty. And I think this is kind of neat. So here's this blood vessel, and you can see these plaques inside of it here. In angioplasty, they, they put in, they thread through the blood vessel a thing that's like an inflatable balloon, and it basically pushes outward to flatten the plaques, and that help, helps open up the, uh, the blood vessel again. Now, when they do angioplasty and they push the blood vessel open again, the blood vessel will tend to build up the plaques again and, and go back to its smaller size. And so oftentimes they put in what's called a stent, S-T-E-N-T. -E and it's basically a little d tube, a hard tube inside that keeps the blood vessel open so it doesn't uh, clog itself up again. Um, I had an uncle had a couple of different stents put into his, uh, into his heart. Okay, uh, well, um, so a few more things about how serious these heart attacks are. Heart, uh, are. Um, they are the major cause of death here in the United States. If you look at this graph here, um, 
uh, heart disease is, is the, the number one uh, killer. Um, and so, you know, maybe not too surprising, because remember, uh, you know, so heart disease is atherosclerosis. It can kill you slowly by eventually causing congestive heart failure, or it can kill you suddenly uh, by causing a, a, a heart attack, a, a myocardial infarction. And so, you know, how do you avoid it? Well, um, remember that what causes it is these plaques, these buildups of fat and cholesterol in the blood vessels. So eating a healthier diet that's low in, in saturated fats and cholesterol helps re uh, reduce it. And also, uh, cutting out smoking also helps. Uh, smoking tends to cause plaques to build up in the arteries. And that seems a little weird at first, because cigarettes don't have any fat. So you might say, well, how does cigarette smoking put fat in my arteries? Well, the cigarette smoke damages the walls of the arteries. And where the arteries get damaged, uh, that tends to be to seed uh, um, plaques growing there. So yeah, proper diet, no smoking, and exercise tends to reduce the plaques, reduce the atherosclerosis. OK, I've got like five minutes left, and I think I have just enough time to finish off the lecture. The, these cardiovascular system problems that I've been showing here in the board all have to do with damage to the heart. This last one is not, is called shock, is not damage to the heart. It's where the person has too little blood volume. So who remembers? What's the normal blood volume of a healthy person? No. Five liters. Five liters of blood is the normal blood volume. Um, if a person suddenly loses a lot of their blood, then, well, obviously they have, they have a lower blood volume, but then they're going to have inadequate blood flow, right? Because they, there's just too little blood circulating through their system. And we call that hypoperfusion. That means inadequate blood flow. And so if a person's having hyper, hypoperfusion, their organs are not getting an, enough blood. And so their organs are going to suffer from lack of oxygen and lack of nutrients. And pretty soon their organs are going to start dying. And so that's what shock is. The person loses blood volume. They lose blood, basically. And so they get hypoperfusion, so their organs get damaged. Uh, and, and we call that shock. Um, the, what can cause it? Well, bleeding is a major thing. Like a person gets in some sort of accident and just bleeds out some of their five liters of blood, that's going to give them a lot lower blood volume, and so they'll, they can go into shock. Uh, but it's not just loss of blood. If they get severe burns, that could also cause blood and other body fluids to exit their body. That can put them into shock. Dehydration, if for whatever reason, like the person's lost in the desert, they're not drinking enough water, that also lowers their blood volume, and so they get inadequate circulation. Um, Oh, and I should say, well, what happens? Uh, so here's my cartoon of the person going into shock. Their, their blood volume just gets a lot lower than the normal five liters. Uh, so what happens? Well, they get low blood pressure, maybe not too surprising, because remember that the smaller the blood volume, the, the, the lower the blood pressure is going to be. They get low blood pressure. Their heart rate will speed up. And here's why. The heart realizes that the, that the tissues are getting too little blood flow. So the heart tries to compensate by increasing the cardiac output, by increasing how much blood it pumps per minute. So they get low blood pressure, but a rapid heartbeat. They get cold and pale skin, because part of what keeps your skin warm and, and colored is the blood flowing through the skin. But if you have inadequate circulation, then your skin's not getting that blood flow, so it tends to be cold and pale. And because the brain is getting too little blood flow, the person can get confused and, and even fall unconscious. OK, so here I've been emphasizing that the, the shock can be caused by the person losing body fluids. There's something else that can cause it called anaphylactic shock, which is not that the person's body is losing fluids, but their blood vessels are losing water to the surrounding tissues. And let me explain the way this works. So a person can have an allergic reaction, and that's where some substance gets inside the person's body, like a bee sting venom. And the, the person's immune system sees this as a foreign substance and starts to, to fight it. Well, 
some people have severe allergic responses called anaphylactic shock to things like bee venom or penicillin shots or peanuts. And so when these people get exposed to like a bee sting or a penicillin shot or, or peanuts, their immune system overreacts to it. And one of the ways the immune system overreacts is it makes too much histamine. And let's remember histamine. I think I mentioned that earlier. Histamine is a substance that your immune system makes that causes your capillaries to become leaky. And so these poor people, when they get exposed to some of these allergens, their immune system makes way too much histamine. So their capillaries become way too leaky. Here's you see the histamine. And so all of a sudden their capillaries get way too leaky. Wait a minute, we'll see some water exiting here. Come on, leakiness. Here we go. In anaphylactic shock, way too much histamine is made. A whole bunch of water exits their blood vessels through the capillaries because the capillaries become leaky. And so again, you get shock, you get too little blood volume. Um, almost done, just give me a couple more minutes. Um, so if a person goes into shock, that's life-threatening, some, some first aid books say that you should raise the person's legs a little bit to cause what blood they do have to go back to closer to their brain. But other first aid books say don't do that because the person might have a spinal injury and you could, could be paralyzing them. And so basically you have to get them to the hospital. There's not a lot of good first aid for shock. When they get to the hospital, what do the doctors do? Basically add back more blood. Uh, you know, the problem is that the person has too little blood volume, so the doctors just give them a big transfusion to replace their blood. Another thing the doctors can do is add solutes to the person's blood, like a lot of salt. Now, who can tell me why would that increase the person's blood volume? Bad water by the process of osmosis, yeah. And so these medicines that are basically a high concentration of salt or other solutes um, are called plasma expanders. And that's what they do. The, the, the doctors add all these solutes to the person's blood that causes water to go into the blood by osmosis. And so that restores the person's blood volume back up to its normal five liters and that takes them out of shock. Oh, perfect, finished right at the time. Okay, well, so thank you. <laughs>